a long, long, long time ago when I was a student, we were probably complaining about the size of the books or the thickness of the books we had to read because they were quite massive, as I recall it. And you clearly had the impression the authors had been paid by the number of pages they produced and not so much how many copies they sold. And then our teacher, he was a smart guy, he said, every time you come across something you find important when you read these uh, big books, write it down in your notebook. And this was back in the days when a notebook was actually a book and not a computer. And we actually had pens as well. So we would write with pens in our notebooks. And the smart thing was then, when you got to the examination, you didn't have to read that big fat book. You could just consult your notes and that would be it. And actually it worked because it all came back to you. When you read your notes, you you really didn't have to consult the big book again. So that was a wonderful tip. The reason why I mentioned that story is that this book is super concentrated. Contrary to the textbooks that I knew from when I went to school, this one, I have a feeling I'm reading Freeman's notes, actually. It's that concentrated. And uh, therefore, I've read it two times now, and there are sections in it I read three, four, five times maybe, and I still find new stuff. Do yourself a favor and read it slowly or read it several times. It is that good. And uh, links in the description, of course, to help you uh, buy a copy. But I, I must say, the more I read, the better I like this book. So in the last video, I talked about Betty Edwards and turning things upside down. I think that went pretty okay. But what wasn't so good was the thing about putting labels on things. Um, maybe that came a little bit out of the blue. So I just want to reiterate that point. And I think Freeman here, he actually put some very good words to this. He says, it was Monet, the painter, who said that in order to see, we must first forget the name of the thing we're seeing. And I think that's beautifully said. And he then continues with some, some, some text that I won't read, but it, it could actually have just as well have been in Betty Edwards' book. And then he ends up here quoting uh, Frederick Frank. And he says, By these labels, we recognize everything and no longer see anything. We know the labels on the bottles, but we never taste the wine. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was actually, in essence, <laughs> the point I was trying to make in the last video. Two videos back, I talked about this book by Sean Talker. And uh, I talked about his ability to use criticism or feedback in his work and in his life. And I think maybe I need to put a little bit more words to that. And that's actually the main point with this video, is to talk about different levels of criticism. Now imagine, and I promise you that this is very theoretical, but imagine I took my guitar, went down to the local train station and sat down and began to play. And people would pass by and listen to what I did and uh, maybe they would enjoy me playing my guitar. Then all of a sudden someone stops, listens to what I'm doing and says, Frederick, that is the worst guitar play I have ever heard in my life. Could you please stop what you're doing? Go home and sell your guitar and never ever play guitar again, please. Now this is criticism from someone you have no relationship to. So I call this level one criticism because I don't know how qualified that person is. And uh, yeah, and this is often what happens on social media. Many of us, when we put out our pictures and stuff like that, you know, we, we don't know who's talking. I mean, even though people identify themselves, we have no idea how qualified are they. So this is what I call level one criticism. Then I think about the criticism a little bit there on down on the train station. And uh, I then say to myself, wait, maybe my fingers weren't warm. Let me play a little bit more. And I continue. Now, five minutes later, exactly the same happens. Someone comes up to me, listens to what I'm doing and says exactly the same sentence, delivers exactly the same criticism or critique. Now I look up and lo and behold, it's Carlos Santana. Now, Carlos Santana, if you don't know him, he is on the Rolling Stone list of the 100 best guitar players in the world. I believe he's number 20, if my memory serves me right. It doesn't really matter. He's a really, really good guitar player. 
He knows what he's doing. He's a capacity. He can assess my work. Yeah. So this is what I call level two criticism. That's actually from someone who has insight and capacity into photography. I mean, we're talking guitar play here, but I'm, I'm sure you follow. So that's level two criticism from someone who's actually qualified. Yeah. So for reasons beyond me, and I don't know how I do it, but I managed to motivate myself after that criticism from Carlos Santana and keep continue to play. You won't believe it, but five minutes later, exactly the same happens. I play, someone stops and listens, delivers that criticism, and I look up and I see David Gilmore. Now, David Gilmore is the guitarist I aspire to become. He's my role model, he's my guru, the music he plays is some of the best I've ever heard. I have listened to David Gilmore since I was yay big. All the way back from Live at Pompeii, Animals, Oma Goma, Wish You Were Here, all the way up to The Wall and so on. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Pink Floyd, the rock band Pink Floyd, and the guitarist in that band. Now, it doesn't really matter if this doesn't ring a bell. The point is that it not only is a very, very good guitarist, he's also on the top 100 list uh, of all-time uh, guitar players. Uh, Jimmy is number one, by the way. But the difference between Carlos and David is David is, you know, who I aspire to become. So if all of a sudden, this is what I call level three criticism. All of a sudden, the criticism is of a whole different scale because it's like my mother my father and all the expertise you can think of boiled into one person criticizing my work and that is serious business right so the reason why i'm telling you this story is that as far as i can tell if there's you know <laughs> some remote truth to the story that sean is telling i have no idea uh, and i I have every reason to believe he's telling the truth here. But as far as I can tell, he doesn't go into that much detail uh, about it. But as far as I can tell, he has two, at two central points in his life received level three criticism. And that's why I'm so impressed with his way of working with criticism and feedback. And it's not just level one feedback, because I hope most of us can handle that. Um, we're talking level three feedback. Finally, in this video, I want to go a little bit off subject, maybe relative to the thumbnail, and just show you uh, a little story I have related to a tree that grows quite close to where I live. And it's a tree that I sometimes notice and sometimes I don't notice. So let's see what the clown has to say here. So I want to show you something here where I find this equally interesting and equally frustrating and it's because down here I know there is a good picture hiding there's a small tree amongst much bigger th trees and I can see that there's something or a potential here but I can't figure out how to shoot that little thing and uh, sometimes when I'm in the zone I can see that there's something here and other times you know, I just walk walk by and don't notice anything. But I want to share it with you, so maybe you can help me figure out what's up and down here. I don't know really what the story is here, but I think it's a small tree amongst the big trees. Maybe it's the colors, maybe it's, I don't know. But here it is, let me just show you. That little thing there, this branch here, I would like to chop that down, but of course I don't do that. That would be that would be a bad thing to do. But this this little tree here, maybe I just need to come down here with a very wide lens as there is on this GoPro. So what, what's the story here? I think it has something to do with being a small tree right next to some very big trees. Sorry if this makes you seasick. Um, but let me just show you here. There are some massively big trees here. Just 
around the corner and then there are some smaller trees here and then there is this tree and I think also it has something to do with the shape of the tree that it sort of it refuses to grow upwards but it insists to grow sideways and uh, yeah that fascinates me maybe going very close to it I don't know I'll figure it out yeah, that was a very confident last sentence there. I'll figure it out. I haven't figured it out yet. And I've been passing that tree for several years now. So uh, my confidence is uh, declining. If you have some tips and tricks for me, uh, I'm really grateful if you could help me figure out how to shoot that little tree. You could say, of course, have a pre-visualized and an idea about how I want to shoot that thing. No. I'm not so strong in pre-visualization. I know Ansel Adams says this is the way to do it. And uh, yeah, it does. That's, I work in a different way, I must say. But any help you can give me, much appreciated. The next time I will actually talk a little bit about Ansel Adams. I will also be talking about this book that many of you recommended. And thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, Galen Rowles, I hope that's the right way of saying his name. In a game of outdoor photography. I have ordered it, it's in the mail, and I hope it will be with me soon so I can read it, review it, and share with you what I think of it. But for now, as always, happy shooting, take care, bye-bye.